I hope and pray that you are all safe and secure in your respective homes. I'm doing this broadcast from our living room here in Scarborough. So from our living room to wherever you are right now, welcome everyone. I thank God that you can all watch this broadcast as we study together God's Word, even as we continue to face this coronavirus crisis. Friends, our heart's desire is that through this broadcast, you will be encouraged to continue with your walk with God and serve Him with all your heart. Now, if you want to encourage us, our team, for putting this broadcast together, why not type below where you are watching from? Or just tell us how this broadcast is blessing you. Friends, we appreciate you for engaging with us throughout this entire program. You know, one of the most difficult struggles we all wrestle with is the problem of suffering, especially when you have been trying your best to please God. Somehow we think that it's unfair that God would allow us to go through suffering when we have been trying to live a good life. Friends, it's sad, but it's true. This pandemic is causing some people to doubt the goodness of God. You see, friends, there is a misconception here. As some people think that the God we worship is like the, the genie in Aladdin's lamp, that once we rub God's pleasure, then we are entitled to get whatever we want. Friends, I'm afraid that's not the God that we read in our Bibles. You see, we need to realize that the overarching purpose of God when He allows us to go through some challenging ordeal or even a crisis in life, the verse we often use is to comfort people who are facing difficulties is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. But often we fail to read the succeeding verse, verse 29, which tells us the ultimate goal of God for each one of us. So let's read together these two verses to get it in context. Verse 28 says, and we know that in all things, look at those two words, all things. That means everything that is happening to us, the good things as well as the not so good things. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. If, that means, friends, in the crucible of God's wisdom, he can use the good as well as the bad things in our lives to turn it out for something good who have been called according to his purpose. And what's his purpose? That's verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestines, friends, here's the purpose, to be conformed to the image of his son. You see, God's overarching goal, his ultimate purpose for us is to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That means, friends, for you and I to grow in Christ-likeness. Now, a lot of times to change our character, we have to go through adversity. It's during those times of crisis when we discover how impatient we are, how unloving we can be, how ungrateful we are, or how shallow our faith really is. You see, friends, God never promised Christians a Disneyland while here on earth. Instead, we've been promised a battlefield. The Christian life is not an, an easy downhill slide. It's a up climb, uh, 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 climb uphill. In fact, if you want an easy going kind of life, friends, I do not suggest that you become a born again Christian. Just join the world and go with the flow. Just eat and drink and party all you want and make happiness the main pursuit of your life. But if you follow Jesus Christ, do you know what the Bible says? Here in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. The Apostle Peter wrote, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. And then the Apostle Paul wrote here in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 8, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. You see, friends, nobody likes suffering. I mean, if you enjoy suffering, then something might be wrong up here. And yet, suffering is one unavoidable consequence 
since the fall of man into sin. It is part and parcel of human existence. The Apostle Paul said the whole creation is groaning. Our bodies are in the process of decay. Everything is winding down. All of us will die. It's just a matter of time. But when the world sees how a Christian suffers with such grace, with such peace, that passes understanding, then friends, that's what Paul is saying, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. You know, Jesus himself assured us that in this world, we will have trouble. But he was quick to add to comfort us, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Now, in this Old Testament narrative that we will study today, we will discover truths that can help us when you find your faith in the furnace. Through this study, we will discover if you are, or if I am, an even if Christian, or an only if Christian. So if you have your Bibles with you, kindly turn to Daniel chapter 3. It has 30 verses there. This, of course, is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. This story is too familiar to many of us. In fact, even if we even, we, even if we don't read this chapter, many of us, if not all of us, can recall the story. But you know, sometimes this familiarity numbs us to the truths embedded in the story. And so my prayer is that God will give us fresh insight from this story and that God's Spirit will give us a new perspective on how to stand strong when you find your faith in the furnace. You see, friends, I don't have to be a prophet to tell you that sooner or later, we will all find ourselves in a fiery furnace. The only question that remains unanswered is, will you and I stand up or will we bow down? How can you and I remain strong when we find our faith in the furnace? So are you ready? If you're watching this broadcast with other people, just turn to them and say, are you ready? Okay, now? Let's set the backdrop to Daniel chapter 3 in our study when you find your faith in the furnace. This, of course, is Babylonian Empire. This is at its zenith. Whenever we hear of the name Babylon, we think of the hanging gardens of Babylon. This is considered to be one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. And then, of course, when we think of Babylon, we think of, of a name. And that is Nebuchadnezzar, the undisputed ruler of the world. He was an able general who reigned for 40 years and never lost a battle. Now, the account that we read here in Daniel chapter 3 took place around 586 B.C., the same year that Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. And so now, to celebrate the victory, Nebuchadnezzar decided to construct an image. We're not sure whether it was an image of himself or the image of his patron god Nebo. But it's to declare to everyone that he and his God reign supreme. But, we will, but what we will see here in this story is that Nebuchadnezzar was in for a big surprise. In this chapter, we have this thrilling account of these three young boys who were thrown into a fiery furnace because they would not worship the image of gold which the king had erected. So here we'll discover what it means to take a stand for the Lord Jesus and refuse to compromise with the gods of this world. Okay, the first thing we see here is the construction of the image. Verse 1 opens up with these words. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 90 feet high and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. You know, everything Nebuchadnezzar did was lavish. I mean, this image that he constructed was about the height of a nine-story building. That's a very huge image protruding out of the ground from the plain of Dura. You can see this statue even if you're kilometers away, especially because it glistens under the sun. You see, this nine-story idol was made of gold. Now, it could not have been a solid, pure gold statue because there's not enough gold in all of Babylonia to fill a 9 feet by 90 feet monument. So most likely it was gold plated, but still it was a magnificent image of gold. And so King Nebuchadnezzar had this image constructed. Possibly one reason is to deify himself. You see, in chapter 2 of Daniel, God already revealed to him 
through Daniel that he was the golden head of the image he had seen in his dream. But like so many other rulers, he was not satisfied to be just the head. He wanted to be the entire image. And so possibly because of all his accomplishments, Nebuchadnezzar now pop up with pride, declared himself to be a god just like the Caesars. Another possible reason is that he built this golden image to magnify his patron god Nebo for helping him wipe out his enemies, particularly the most recent one, Israel, thereby proving that Nebo is greater than Yahweh. And then thirdly, it could have been to unify the nation. You see, the king was trying to consolidate his empire and unify its many provinces politically. Nebuchadnezzar understood that one effective way to unite the people politically is to unite them religiously. And so he signed presidential decree number 666 that everyone should worship this idol. So after the construction of the image, we are told here in verse 2, he then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he had set up. In those days when the king said, come, everybody came. Imagine what it was like on the plain of Dura. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of leaders were gathered there, all in their official robes and military uniforms. Oh, what a sight it must have been. They were being interviewed on Fox News Babylon. Many of them were lining up to shake hands with the king and take a selfie with him. And then verse 4 tells us that a herald, this is the king's personal chaplain whose job was to proclaim what the king wanted to say. So this hired preacher of the king announced that when everyone heard the sound of music playing, it was the king's command that they all fall down and worship the image of gold. And as an added motivation to obey the king's command, he added in verse 6, to help you make to help you make up your minds, the king has a burning fiery furnace ready for those who will not bow. Now that will certainly help them make up their minds, isn't it? So the music began to play and people fell to the ground by the thousands. That is all except three. There were these three Hebrew young men who did not bow down. So we have the construction of the image, the dedication of the image, and now the rejection of the image. You know, it's not easy to go against the flow. When everybody is doing the same thing, it's not easy to be different. It's difficult to go against the majority and not be noticed. And sure enough, a complaint was filed against them. And we, it says here in verse 8, At this time, some astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. Now, the word denounce is a strong word. It actually literally means to eat the pieces off. That means it suggests malicious intention. So these critics went to the king and told him that some rebellious Jews would not bow down to the image, specifically naming Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Have you noticed that? People get upset with a Christian who refuses to go along with their lifestyle. See, people get upset when you don't laugh at their dirty jokes or go along with them in their dishonesty. I mean, why is it that people get upset with the few who refuse to bow down to the gods of this world? Why? Well, friends, it's because if you worship the one true God and walk in His holiness, you are a bother to their conscience. They want you to go along with their one-night stand or casual sex or live in so everybody will be happy with their sin. You see, people are not satisfied to be in sin by themselves. They want to drag everyone else into sin. Remember? Eve took the forbidden fruit, ate it, and then gave it to her husband. From that time, fallen man has always been wanting others to participate in their sinfulness. You see, friends, Satan is not content to go to hell by himself. He wants to drag as many people with him as possible. But these three Hebrew young men, they found out that they would not bow. Can you picture this? young men standing there in front of the king, the mightiest empire on earth? Wow! How is this even possible? How can they have such courage, such conviction? You know, I suspect 
that while they were young, they had been taught in their home that they are not to bow down to gods and that in their Sunday school, they were taught about the commandments of God and the Bible admonishes us here in Proverbs 22 verse 6, train a child in the way he should go and when he is old, he will not turn from it. You see, we must in inculcate godly values to our young people now before the worldly pressures come pressing upon them. Brothers and sisters, make up your mind while you are still young and stand up for Jesus regardless the cost. Why? Because if you will not bow down, the next step that the world will try is to make you bend. And that's what happened here that they found out they would not bend. Because of their refusal to bow, there was now a political crisis. So these three young men were brought before the king and in amazement, the king asked them in verse 14, is it true? I mean, he could not believe his ears. He could not believe that anybody was foolish enough to defy him. One word from Nebuchadnezzar and men would bow down before him. He had the idea that everybody has a price. You know, many people do have their price. Some people will compromise their convictions for a very small price. Remember Judas? He sold the Lord Jesus for just 30 pieces of silver. Did you know that 30 pieces of silver was just the buying rate for an ordinary slave? You know, he could have at least charged for more. It's the Lord Jesus Christ he's selling. Brother, sister, what is your price to make you compromise? I mean, thank God some people in this world are not for sale. I praise God for Christian men and women who cannot be bought, who would not accept a bribe, who would not sacrifice their integrity for a sum of money, who would not accept riches through dishonest gain, who would stand for their convictions and not bow down to the idols of this world, the idol of power, the idol of popularity, the idol of pleasure. Well, Nebuchadnezzar liked to try another approach to bend this young man to his will. You know, he was used to bending the wills of others. And we could almost hear a change in the tone of his voice as he began to talk to them in verse 15. Young men, perhaps you did not understand the imperial command. I'm going to give you one more chance. I'll have the orchestra play again. And if, when the tune is played, you get down on your knees and worship the image, all will be well. And then he quickly warned them, if you don't do it, you will be thrown immediately into the burning, fiery furnace. You know, that's what the world does, isn't it? If we refuse to bend, it has its furnaces to put us in. There's the furnace of rejection. There's the furnace of ridicule. There's the furnace of laughter. I mean, one of the most effective tools the devil has with people today is laughter. Nobody likes to be laughed at. We don't want to be rejected. So when we refuse to yield to pressure, when we refuse to drink, when we refuse to sacrifice our purity, when we refuse to go along with their dishonesty, there will always be those who will laugh and reject us. But brothers and sisters, we need to remind ourselves that when we stand for what is right and people oppose us, then the battle is not between us and them, but between them and God. So when the king asked in verse 15, look at those last words. He said there, what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? You know, with that statement, the battle lines have shifted. What the king did not realize was that with that question, he had moved the focus of the battle. Now the battle was not between the king and the young man. It was now between the king and the God of heaven. Who is that God? He was saying, I don't believe such a God exists. There is no God who can deliver you from my burning, fiery furnace. Friends, we need to realize that just because people do not know of such a God does not mean there is no such God. Just because people do not know about the God of heaven, that does not change the fact that there is the God in heaven. So let the infidels laugh. Now Nebuchadnezzar was in for a big surprise. He was about to hear words that had never been heard in the corridors of his palace. Notice what their answer was in verses 16 to 18. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, they said, 
We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If you are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Wow! I mean, picture this young man standing there in front of the king, the mightiest ruler of all the earth. You know, it's wonderful to see when young people, they have courage, they have their convictions. Young people are not afraid to stand up for what is right. Young people who would not compromise their walk with the Lord for the pleasures of this world. And so because of their defiance, verse 13 says the king was furious with rage. I mean, he took, he took their defiance as a personal affront. When he gave, then he gave them orders. He expected, you know, everyone to obey. Nobody ever dared defy the king of Babylon. The king commanded that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than it was normal. Normally it was. And so, you know, that reminds us seven times hotter. You know, that reminds us that for us Christians, the opposition against us is seven times more intense than they are for the people in this world. We may have more difficulties now that we belong to the Lord than when we were just following the world. Before we became Christians, we were just going along with the stream. Now we are going against the stream. That's why we experience more difficulties than ever before. The devil looks at our lives and he says, Turn up the heat seven times. And then they bound with ropes those three young men wearing their official robes. The furnace was so hot that even the king's men assigned to throw them in could not withstand the tremendous temperature. They were consumed. These are the guards, you know, just throwing out the boys. They burned up. Just throwing those boys in. But you know what happened? These Hebrew young men, not only would they not bow, would they not bend, they would not burn. The king could not believe his eyes. The king again called for all his officials. When they arrived, those pagan Babylonians likewise became witnesses to the power of God. The scientists and experts examined them and what did they find? Friends, not a hair on their heads was burned. They didn't even smell like smoke. Now the God of heaven is showing them who is really in control. So we see here the Lord's power. We see the Lord's power here manifested through his presence with these three Hebrew young men. These three young men were thrown into the burning fiery furnace. The king looked into that furnace and was startled. I mean, we can imagine the king rubbing his eyes and looking again into those flames. The, Hebrew, the young Hebrews were unbound. He asked in verse 24, he, he, he said, Wasn't it there three that we tied up and threw into the fire? They assured him that was so. Then the king said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. You know, in the actual Hebrew text, Nebuchadnezzar said, one is like unto a son of the gods. You know, that was the only way this pagan king knew how to describe what he saw. He had no spiritual vocabulary so, uh, he, he could use to, to describe the spiritual reality. That was, it was just beyond his ability to understand. But we know what he saw, friends. It's not a son of the gods. What he saw is the son of God himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, walking with those faithful believers in that furnace of fire. So what's the lesson here, friends? How many went into the fiery furnace? Three. But when the king counted them, how many? Four. That means, brothers and sisters, when we go through a furnace experience, the Lord Jesus Christ is already in there waiting for us. When we go through trials, you can be sure of this, Jesus will never leave us nor forsake us. So when you're going through a fiery experience, do not ask, Lord, where are you? He's right there with you. He will walk with you and strengthen you throughout your ordeal. Friends, did you notice that the only thing that got burned 
in these three Hebrew boys' fiery experience were the ropes that bound them. Brothers and sisters, one valuable lesson we learn here is that God allows us to go through the furnace in order to set us free from things that have bound us. God will take that furnace and use it to rid your life of those things that hinder you from becoming the kind of man, the kind of woman God designed you to be. Are you in a fiery furnace these days? I don't know what your furnace experience is, but remember Jesus is there with you and his plan is to burn off the ropes that bind you. To burn that rope of unbelief. To burn that rope of immorality, that rope of dishonesty, that rope of bitterness and unforgiving spirit. Maybe that rope of selfishness and greed. Or maybe that rope of pride and prayerlessness. Not only was the Lord's power manifested by His presence with His Hebrews, it was also manifested, they were tied up, it was also manifested by His preservation. God was keeping His word. Remember what he promised in Isaiah chapter 43, verses 2 and 3? When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. You see, that furnace became like a microwave oven. You know, the microwave oven is, is an amazing thing, isn't it? I mean, the fire in the microwave oven is selective. It hits some things, but others are not heated. You see, the flames in this furnace became selective flames. They did not burn the boys, but according to Scripture, the bonds, the ropes that bound them were burned off by the flames of the furnace. You see, God manifested His control by preserving His people. Again, one valuable lesson we learn here, friends, is that God lets us go through the furnace in order to set us free from things that have been binding us. You know that fiery experience you're going through is going to be used by God to release you from your addiction, to liberate you from pornography, to unbind you from nicotine and alcoholism, to set you free from that dirty, rotten attitude. God will take that fire and use it to rid your life of those things that hinder you from becoming the kind of man, the kind of woman God designed you to be. And then thirdly, the Lord's power was manifested with his promotion of the Hebrews. The last verse, verse 30, it says there, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Maybe he gave them an increase in salary. Maybe he expanded their official responsibilities and gave them better living quarters. Whatever it is, through this pagan king, God brought the Hebrew young men to a place of promotion as a result of their fiery experience. Friends, I believe this with all my heart, that after we go through a fiery experience, God is going to promote us. Definitely, we now have a bigger capacity to endure, a deeper faith to trust God, and a higher sense of purpose to embark on new exploits for God. So what are the major life lessons here, brothers and sisters? We know that the fiery furnace experiences in life are inevitable. Sooner or later, they are go we are going to face them. So how then should you and I respond when you find your faith in the furnace? Three things, A, B, and C. And then we'll end. Letter A, accept God's sovereignty, whether the result is triumph or tragedy. Remember, friends, we do not live by explanations. We live by faith. God doesn't owe us an explanation as to why things are happening around us. When we're going through a crisis, we need to step back and see the hidden hand of God and we need to respect God's sovereignty. You see, life is a mystery. There are the good things and there are the bad things and God in the crucible of His wisdom mixes all things for His glory and we know that in all things God works for good. Just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean it doesn't make sense. Remember Acts chapter 12, James and Peter were arrested. James was tragically murdered, but Peter was triumphantly delivered. So number one, accept God's sovereignty whether the result is triumph or tragedy. And then letter B, believe God's deliverance, whether it is out of the fire or through 
the fire. Remember, there are no limits to God's power. Sometimes God delivers us out of the fire. Sometimes He delivers us through the fire. Just believe. And then let her see, confess God's goodness, whether the suffering is fair or unfair. This Hebrew young man said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. He will rescue us from your hand, O king. But then they also said, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Friends, are you prepared for the even ifs of life? You see, some people are willing to serve God only if God will give them what they want. But there are others who are willing to obey God even if they don't get what they want. You see, brothers and sisters, it takes great faith to say, God will heal me. That takes great faith. But it takes even greater faith to say, but even if I don't get healed, I will serve God and be faithful to Him to the end. Brother, sister, are you an even if Christian or are you an only if Christian? It's unfortunate, but there are Christians today who are going through a fiery furnace experience and they are willing to remain faithful to God only if they get what they want. But praise God that there are also Christians today who are going through the furnace and they are saying in their hearts, God can deliver me, but even if not, I will still obey Him. God can heal me, but even if not, I will continue to praise Him. God can grant my desire, but even if not, I will remain faithful to Him. Brother, sister, which one are you? Are you an even if Christian? or an only if Christian. Brothers and sisters, will you remain faithful to God even if? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this story that you preserve in our Bibles. Lord, we ask that these precious lessons will continue to ring in our minds and in our hearts so that whatever is happening in the world today, we will continue to serve you. We will continue to praise you. Whatever happens, even if, whatever happens, Lord, we will continue to worship you and serve you the best way we can. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. And God's people say, Amen. Friends, write to us. Tell us how this uh, message has blessed you but for now goodbye and may you have a safe and secure time as you con as we continue to face this crisis that we are in thank you and god bless everyone thank you so much for watching today's celebration if you have committed your life to christ today we have a special gift for you Please send us a note by visiting our website at championlife.ca and select contact. You can also send your prayer requests or call us by phone. And remember, you can give your tithes and offering to our website. Thanks to give, use the Champion Life Center app or e-transfer. Just make sure to select the location you are giving to. And lastly, don't forget to follow us on our social media pages. This is the best way to engage and update it with our Champion Life community and we want to stay connected with you. We are so glad that you have joined us and we hope to see you online next Sunday. God bless you.